And uh, I want to thank the live stream for being here with us today, as, as well as our uh, in-person congregation. Um, recently, we have just finished a series. Um, it's been an exciting series on the resurrection. Uh, and today, once again, we're going to have another transition message and talking about a topic that I feel was very important um, in, the, in the life of Christians. Okay? So today we're going to be talking about prayer. Uh, the name of this sermon is Pray For Us. So starting out, I can't think of a better way to start a message of prayer, but to pray. So, let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, Father. I thank you for everything you do. I thank you for who you are, Father. We adore you um, as a church and as believers, Father. And uh, we want to thank you um, for bringing us here together, uh, Father, to learn uh, more about you, Father. And uh, uh, that is our will, Father, to understand grace and your peace even better and better, Father, uh, as we continue through this life. Uh, watch over me as I speak today. Uh, guard my words carefully, Father, and I ask this all in the holy, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, starting out today, uh, I was going to start by actually reading a short psalm. Uh, I was talking about, uh, it talks about the magnificence and uh, the wor uh, how worthy God is of our prayers, but I'm actually going to move that to the end, okay? So, expect a psalm at the end, and we'll make that our, our prayer together. Um, starting out, uh, I like to discuss story time, oh, a, a story, okay? So, in a good story, it, we usually have five components of a story. It's called the five W's. Who, what, when, where, why. It's been taught in English class, you know, uh, for as far back as uh, I can remember, and I'm sure many other people are familiar with the who, what, when, where, why of a story. So starting out, I'd like to talk about God's story. Um, God has this, even before time began, God was composing this, this amazing story. And as we look through the Bible, we get to take part of that and, and read and understand what God is doing um, throughout history. Uh, prayer is an, a crucial component of this story, per se. And today we're going to look at the who, what, when, where, why of prayer. God has authored a story, and as the body of Christ, we take part in the story and interact with God um, through this conduit of prayer. So prayer has an amazing place in the story. Our forefathers of the faith, they prayed. They prayed for deliverance, thanks, all. Our Savior, he prayed that God's will would be done. Uh, he prayed for strength uh, as, he carried out this, uh, as he carried out God's will. And now we as the church... In this story, in this chapter, I guess you could say of it, we arrive on the scene and the expectation has not changed. We are still called to be a people of prayer. So starting out, I mentioned some of these high points of the story. You know, you can start all the way in Genesis and the stories of faith with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then the, you continue on, the law is delivered to Moses. And you see this cycle of rejection from this point on from Israel where they was cutting on their, they would turn on their faith almost like a light switch. On, off, on, off, wrath, peace, wrath, peace. And then eventually, this comes to the point where Jesus himself comes uh, as his plan before uh, creation had uh, purposed. And these people who continuously rejected Christ, they crucify him. They kill the man who came um, for, for their salvation, the God who came for their salvation. But Christ rose again. He was not done with Israel, but had this desire to bring them back uh, to faith. This is where he reveals what we call, or what the Bible calls, the mystery. Now, if you would turn with me to Romans 11, 23 through 26. Uh, Romans 11, 23-26. Now, I want to discuss this because we're going to talk about we as a people of prayer. And in this story, where prayer really fits in um, to our life and as we worship God and we live um, our faith out. And this chapter was basically talking about this the, the Israelites as a... Uh, disobedient people, but it talks about how the remnant remained. 
Then you get to verse 23 and it says, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and will graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree. How much more shall these, which is the, to be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, and as is written, there shall come the, uh, the sign of the deliverer, and shall turn away uh, from ungodliness. And there's many other scriptures where it talks about how the, now the Gentiles and uh, Israel essentially together make the body of Christ. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, as it talks about in Galatians 3.28. We're all one in the body of Christ, and we're called to be a people of prayer. <clears throat> But no better place do we see this transition from Israel to Gentiles to uh, how we understand Scripture now in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, it starts out, and you have this strong emphasis on Peter. And as the story continues on, Peter descends and his message to the Israelites, and Paul ascends in his message of uh, the gospel of grace and peace to the Gentiles. So here we are. The law is fulfilled. Jesus Christ has came. And sufficient grace reigns. And God says this, continue in prayer. Colossians 4.2 Essentially, God is saying, speak with me. The Lord of the universe says, speak with me. If y'all would, turn with me to Ephesians 3.20. And I'll give y'all an even better idea of who we are speaking with when we go to him in prayer. And I will, I'll give y'all a page number. Uh, page 575 for this Bible. Now, as we're talking about uh, who God wants, uh, who God is, who we're speaking to, I say Lord of the universe, and we see plenty of justification for that through the Bible. But in 320, this is who we are praying to. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power of that worketh in us. Earlier this morning, uh, it, it's amazing, uh, me and uh, my, my papa were discussing how we always seem to be on the same wavelength. And as he read this today, I got excited because um, this was also a verse that came to my mind as I thought about um, the prayer. Now, today, uh, we have a, a story that takes place in the Bible. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. And we'll camp here for a while. Um, so you don't have to keep switching back and forth too much. First Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. It's page 581. So, the, uh, before we begin, the reason that I chose this is I'm looking at these heroes of the faith and the, their models of prayer, and specifically Paul, as he speaks to the Gentiles, us. Um, those who weren't uh, of the Jewish population. And he says, here we find Paul addressing a church that he is familiar with. Now, he's addressed his church once. We just went through a series in First Thessalonians. The church was confused as a young church, and um, there's constantly in turmoil being persecuted, and heresy seemed to seep in, seep in, seep in. So here he is addressing them once again, um, talking about uh, heresy. He addresses them, and he's steering them back to sound doctrine. As he nears the end of the letter, we find these words in 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. He says, and I meant 2 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, just one page over. In 2 Thessalonians, we find this. Finally, brethren, pray for us. That the word of the Lord may have free course and be free course and be glorified, even as it uh, was with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful. He shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you, and that the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now, uh, can you continue? And I. This model of prayer was always fascinating to me. 
Because there's three things that I noticed. We can dive into this and we can break it down even more. But this prayer said a few things. First of all, this prayer had purpose, as all prayers should have when we come before the Lord of the universe and address Him. Our prayers have purpose. And in this verse, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. So what is His purpose here? As it should be in all of us, that the gospel is magnified, that the gospel is lifted up, that people will come to know the mystery, come to know salvation. Why do we pray? Well, we pray for a purpose. His prayer had direction. His prayer didn't remain in the past. It didn't even remain in the present. It says, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. I don't know if y'all noticed, that's future tense, okay? He's praying for something to come. So his prayer had purpose, it had direction. And it subverted human will beneath God's will, like all prayers should be. Our will beneath God's, while yet still addressing human needs. When we pray, we do address the needs that we have, and God is attentive. He will listen. So today, um, we're going to discuss this. And uh, I say that God responds in prayer, but I, I want y'all to no uh, notice this as, as we dive deeper into this. God, uh, there was a quote uh, by a man named John Wesley. Some of y'all know him, some, some do not. And this verse has always grinded at me, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain why. And I don't want anybody to think that this is where I'm going in the direction of this. There's a verse that says, God does nothing but in response to prayer. The problem with that, first of all, as, as we continue on, and we talk about how God responds to us in prayer, I don't want to think, anyone to think that, we are li that God is limited by any prayer or any imagination that we can conceive. Amen. For as a matter of fact, God made the earth. Who prayed for that to happen? Okay? <laughs> uh, it said God may allow tragedy. Who sits here and prays, God, please allow this tragedy to happen? Nobody. Okay? <clears throat> so who prayed that? Nobody. God is not limited by our prayers. Okay? Yeah. So as I say this, don't get the wrong idea. Okay? As we go through this. I'm going to try my best to explain this and uh, how God responds to prayer, but I don't want anybody to think that God is in any way limited by any human effort. Okay? So first of all, we're talking about the who, what, when, where, why of prayer. Some of these will be short, some of these will be a bit longer. But today, we're going to talk about who we pray to first, the who of the story. Every good story has a star of the show. Whether we're talking about superheroes, whether we're talking about good movies, books, everybody has a star of the show. And in our faith... The star should not be us. The star is God. He is the star of the show. In order to have a better idea of how God operates, we need to understand who he is. And this is a, a logical train of thought. Okay? Uh, I was thinking of a poor man. Okay? When we, when, if we discuss uh, poverty, okay? It's hard for a poor person to be as charitable, in, in a sense. Y'all see where I'm going with that. Because as poverty defines the man... How he acts from that way on is also going to come out of that, okay? So understanding how somebody operates, you have to understand who he is and the position that he's in, okay? So God is three persons in one, okay? Well, we refer to this as the Trinity, and a lot of people are like, well, the Bible never says the word Trinity. Well, the Bible gives plenty of justification for the Trinity and triunity of God, okay? Um, so let's just get that off the table right now. Truthfully, the, the interplay between God and how the Spirit and how Jesus and how God operates, it's, it's fascinating, and there's still th some things that maybe God had not, re uh, he revealed what we needed to know, but to see that int the intricacy of that play out is still one thing that baffles me, how, how God is who he is. He's magnificent, he's wonderful. But we need to understand that he's three persons in one, okay? As for prayer, each distinct person in this Godhead this, the three in one, is entirely active in every part of prayer. And we should never subtract any of the three distinct persons of God from any part of our prayer. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son are all active in our prayers. And I say active in a very serious demeanor. Now prayer being the worshipful communi uh, communication unto God. When we communicate with God, it is a form of worship. We put our faith in Him that He can do exceedingly, abundant, uh, exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever imagine, like we discussed earlier in Ephesians 3. 
Amazingly, in each fiber of the believer's prayer, you will find God. Now, think about that. In every prayer that we speak, you will find God. Okay? He lives in the believer uh, by the Holy Spirit. This is, that, means, that makes this a very powerful component of the believer's life. You're communicating with the God of the universe. But I pray the condition of the church never reflects the condition uh, of Israel to where, in Second Chronicles 7, 14, to where God asks, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Okay? I pray that well, the church never gets to a sense to where we don't communicate with God. It's happened in history. It has. And we're talking about this story. There, there was actually a point where God lamented and said, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Let, us not be, uh, let that not be the church today. Okay, We need to be a people defined by prayer. Yet, we find ourselves in this predicament. Unlike that of Israel, the Holy Spirit resides in the church and assures us that regardless of our communication, that we are blessed as believers of Him. Yeah. That we have all spiritual blessings. God blesses, has already blessed us abundantly. Which brings me to my point for who we pray to. As we intercede for others outwardly, the Holy Spirit is our connection to Jesus Christ. Now, where is Jesus Christ? We've discussed this in past sermons. Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And as we pray, He is interceding on our behalf with the Father. Every part of prayer, uh, each, part, uh, each three distinct persons of the Godhead is active. Never forget that. It is a power that we, that we have. If y'all would, turn with me to Romans 8, 26 through 34. And it's page 556 in this scripture. This, this uh, Bible. Romans 8, 26, it says 34. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know uh, not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth that is the mind of the Spirit, because he make intercession for the saints according to the will of God. This is according to the will of God that he, he will act on our behalf. Okay? And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among uh, many brethren. Moreover, whom did he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified. Then he also glorified. What shall then we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for all things, how shall we not with him also uh, freely give us uh, to all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? If God, if Christ had died, he had that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. Yeah. As we discuss prayer... And you read this scripture, try and find one place that the Trinity is not working on your behalf. You won't find it. Or it has worked on your behalf. Because Christ's work was final on the cross and with his resurrection. You can look to that and try to find one place you will not find the Trinity working on your behalf. You will not find it, I promise you. So we talked about the who, the triune God. Now we talk about what we pray. The what of our prayers is a question that I could write books and books and books and books on but never address the full breadth of it. But allow me to at least give y'all some direction, push y'all in a good direction. At one point in my life, I kept searching the scripture for this ideal prayer that I should pray. You know, I, I, I wanted to look to the saints. I wanted to look to those who came before me and just copy their prayers because, hey, it seemed like it worked for them. Okay? <laughs> but never realizing that the places I, I was being pointed to a lot of times were conditional. Okay? As we pray for, uh, to God, the only condition required for the body of Christ is that we believe. Okay? Christ will hear us. But oftentimes, uh, the people I look forward to were stuck in uh, Matthew 6, 14 through 15. Forgive, lest you, will be, uh, lest you won't be forgiven. Okay? You know, 
If our forgiveness is not conditional on any prayer that we pray, any action that we did, our forgiveness is final. Okay? His favor. A lot of times, God, please shine your favor on me. I've prayed that prayer so many times. God has already favored me enough by providing His grace through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. His glory. Once again, going back to the, the prayer of John Wesley, or what, his quote. God's glory is not bound by what we pray. Okay? Pray that we glorify Him more. That, that, that's a wonderful prayer. But never think in your mind that the glory of God is bound or tethered by the words that we speak or what our thoughts. We have peace with God. Okay? His, uh, the peace with God, Romans 5, 1, is final. And if you have peace with God, pray that way. Don't, uh, don't pray these prayers out of fear or um, out of guilt. Pray in a way that exemplifies the peace you have with God. Pray that way. Christ is at the right hand inter interceding for you. And that should be a comforting thought. So what do we pray? We, we pray prayers of peace with, uh, with God. So when we pray, so we got the who, what. Now we talk about the when. With this in mind, have peace when you worship God in prayer. Okay? Now if you would, turn with me to Philippians 4, uh, 4 through 7. And in, in the yellow Bible, it is page 578. Now, whenever we talk about prayer, it's hard not to talk prayer without going to the scripture. It has so much richness to it, so much breath. Okay? It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. That should characterize our prayers. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be, known, be, be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts in mind through Christ Jesus. Now, there's a few things I want to address first here. First of all, when you go to verse 6, it says, it starts out, be careful for nothing. So my question is, why should you be? When your prayer, when you're in communication with God, when you're worshiping communicating with Him, why should, uh, why should we be careful as we come before him in prayer? This is the same God who when Solomon finished praying for the burnt offering to be consumed, God sent fire from heaven. 2 Chronicles 7, one. It is also the same God, okay, now catch this. It's also the same God when Paul, the Apostle Paul asked for prayer for his healing, his answer was a, li a little bit different, or a lot of bit different. What, what did God say? God said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now the thing about it is, in this age that we live in, a lot of times you're going to get that answer. My grace is sufficient. God has done it all for us. God always answers. Always answers, whether it's yes or no, not yet. If you get a similar answer to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. If you get that answer, praise God for it. Because peace always accompanies grace. Try and give me an example where it doesn't. Now, reread uh, Philippians 4, 6, or 7. Be careful for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is peace that passes understandings. Not only does it pass understanding, it guards your hearts and your mind. And who? Once again, talking about the who. In Christ Jesus. In prayer, there is no such thing as failure. Take, take heart in that. There's no such thing as failure, only a better understanding of grace and peace. Okay? Every prayer is a victory because we have the victory in Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. So therefore, take to heart Paul's instruction to pray for supplication. Now catch this. When we pray, how are we supposed to pray? With thanksgiving. Every prayer, whether we're asking something or whether we're adoring God, whether we're just, it's just a prayer of thanksgiving. All prayer should be accompanied with thanksgiving. And we should pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. For the word of the Lord says, states, for all the promises of God in Him are yet and in Him, amen, unto the glory of God for us. 
Now, hearing that, the amazing thing that I see, looking at Philippians 4, 6, and 7, that looks like a promise, okay? It has all the characteristics of a, uh, characteristics of a promise. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I don't see any open-endedness there. That is a firm statement. You pray supplication with thanksgiving, the peace of God will, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Okay? And for all the promises of God in Him are yet and in Him, amen. Now, where do we pray? we got two more. So we've got who, what, when, where. Growing up, I was always t uh, taught to take Jesus' words in Matthew 6.6 6 very literally, uh, and as they should have in their, in their original context. But now, in the, uh, the age of grace, it's a little bit different. In Matthew 6.6, 6, we see these verses where Jesus says, When you pray, go to your closet. Okay? Hide behind that door. Pray. Now, it's a little bit hard, I'll say this, and honestly, if you read that literally with uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it's impossible. It says pray without ceasing, but how can you pray without ceasing if you're not in a closet 24-7? It seems to me that those who taught me this did not realize that not a single person when Jesus taught that sermon had the Holy Spirit. I'm now living in this age that we live in now, our mantra is not hide in a 4 by 4 closet. It's to pray without ceasing. So pray your heart unto God wherever you stand. That's the where. You're always praying to God. You're always worshiping God. You're always glorifying God because His Spirit is within you. The Holy Spirit is not limited by a 4 by 4 closet. The Holy Spirit is not bound, period. When in need of direction, you pray with your lips, you pray with your heart, you pray with your mind, and you develop a lifestyle of worship. That's what prayer is about. It's a lifestyle. A lifestyle of worship. And lastly, why do we pray? I have three easy reasons. The first reason, God told you to. I, I can't think of a better reason. If God tells you to do something, that's a pretty good reason, I feel like. Every time prayer is mentioned, we see that God, it is in God's obvious will. That's a pretty good reason. If, you, if we want to be in the, God's will, right? That's a pretty good reason. God told you to. Why wouldn't we pray? And uh, we can turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19 for a moment. And that's page 5, page 10. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For what? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And quench not the Spirit. We could keep going down, but that's, that's a whole other sermon. But as we discuss it, it says thanksgiving, prayer, rejoicing, all the good things of God. This is the will of God, of Christ Jesus concerning you. We've discussed this before, and like in 1 Thessalonians 5, when you read this, I want you to take this to heart. This is like the New Testament Proverbs, at least to me. That's what I think of it, this last chapter in 1 Thessalonians 5. It tells you how to pray. It tells you what to pray. And it tells you why God wants you to pray. It's His will. Now, as we saw in Philippians 4, uh, 4 whenever we pray, it's supposed to be characterized by thanksgiving. We are to be a, a thankful people unto God. As he has richly and abundantly blessed us. So with that being said, and I'm not saying this at all to guilt, but it is a question that you need to consider. Wouldn't it be a sin not to pray? If God tells you to pray, it's his will, God told you to, what's the opposite of doing it? It's a sin. You're missing the mark that God is calling has on your life when you don't pray and when you're not uh, in thankful communication with them. But now thank God for His grace when we fall short of this. I know I fall short of it. I, I, I can say I'm not always in worshipful communica uh, communication. But by, that by the definition that this is a sin, all of us should be condemned by the shortcomings. But thank God for, the gra for His grace. We are forgiven. He is worthy of our thanks because of this. So, first of all, God told us to. Second of all, God listens. Logically, if God tells us to pray, He will listen. The Holy Spirit dwells within us and ensures that not a single word, not a single praise, not a single tear, not a single song goes unheard. 
prayer changes things. My prayer uh, are often inspired by that of Exodus thirty two fourteen, and we thought we thought, uh, talked about this a little bit earlier this morning. We uh, we went into it, but following Israel's disobedience, this is the story of the golden calf for those of y'all that recall it. So essentially, Moses is up on the mountain, and down below, Moses has been up there for a while. They're looking up for the mountain, like, is he ever going to come down? You know, we're going to go do our own thing now. So his brother Aaron, Moses' brother Aaron takes together all the gold in, the, uh, in Israel's uh, community here, and they make together a golden calf. Okay? So Moses eventually comes back down from the mountain well, with speaking with God. He comes back down, and what does he see? He sees everybody worshiping this golden calf. All right? Now, truthfully, I understand, uh, well, I, probably not as well as, uh, as well, I'm just going to leave that there. Moses was upset, okay? <laughs> Let's leave it there. Moses was upset. He was just talking, literally speaking with God. God had gave him the Ten Commandments, okay? So Moses is, he knows of the work of God personally in his life. He comes down and he sees um, Israel worshiping an idol, a golden idol, right after he got done speaking with God. And he gets upset. You know who else is upset at that? God was upset, okay? <laughs> That he was worshiping a, a golden, that they were worshiping a golden calf. Now God was so upset, he was resolved to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And if anybody can do it, it's God. Okay, but it says that Moses pleaded on their behalf, and Scripture states that God repented. Okay, nobody wants to hear that God repented. Okay, it, it, when people hear it, it's like smacking right in the face. Okay, God repented. But the word repent means to change one's mind. How did he change his mind? Well, Moses, uh, Moses asked him to. <laughs> he asked for peace on their behalf. And God listened and responded in prayer. So when uh, Exodus thirty-two fourteen says, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. The Lord was going to wipe them off the face of the earth. But why didn't he? Because he listened to his people. It's amazing, ain't it? I am always inspired in this verse because in sermons, many pastors, many people, whenever I'm in conversation, people stop short and God listens. Well, I usually listen to my wife, Hallie, but that doesn't mean that I always do what she asks me to do. Okay? <laughs> okay. L- uh, listening does not always equate action. God listens and he acts. God listens and he cares for your requests. In Colossians 4, 2, while Paul speaks on, uh, on the gospel spread, he tells the Colossian church to continue in prayer and watch. And watch in the same way with, once again, thanksgiving. There should never be a reason we pray aimlessly. We are to pray, be thankful, and watch. Why do we watch? Because God listens. When we have the Lord of the universe listening to us, we have an amazing power. We've got an amazing ability we are a peculiar people. Yeah. Regardless, knowing that whatever happens, whatever God decides to do uh, in response to our prayer, that God's grace is sufficient and He has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We should never fear. We should never be dismayed. Every, no prayer is a failure. We're just better understanding God's grace and peace through it all. Lastly, my third reason, okay? So, the first reason, God told us to. Our second reason is God listens and acts. My third reason, God told us to. We are in a relationship with Him. He desires to hear from you. Further proof that God came through, with, uh, came through for Paul. We started out where Paul was praying for deliverance. Well, Paul, I uh, mean, God answered Paul's prayer. Uh, in Second Thessalonians, that's one of the earlier letters that Paul written. He, he lived many more years and spoke the gospel to many more people and spread the gospel all over uh, Asia and Europe because of this. God came through when he prayed for that deliverance, that the gospel would, would flourish uh, because of him. God took care of Paul, and he lived, he lived to travel more widespread missionary journeys and provide us more guidance of prayer. There are numerous, almost countless more examples of how God came through in prayer. Actually, there are countless examples of how God came through in prayer. A lot of them we don't even realize that God was watching for us. I encourage you to begin a study yourself on this. 
So in conclusion, go and remember in the peace you have with God, come before Him and pray with confidence. Now, if you don't know, if you don't know this peace uh, as you pray, or maybe you don't know how to pray before God, recognize your need for Him. Believe His gospel that He came, that Christ came, He died on the cross, and He was born again, uh, that He rose again for your justification. Believe in eternal life and this power that I've spoken on, I hope it, it has enticed you, okay? It will be yours by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for being with us here today. And as we close, I want to turn, if you would turn with me, to Psalm 92. The reason I go here is, as I was studying for prayer, this psalm really struck me. Sometimes I, I like to go through and pray the Psalms because it shows the glory, it shows the magnificence of God. This is who you are praying to. This is a good God. It is a good thing to give. Uh, it is a good thing to give thanks unto God and to sing praises unto Thy name, O Most High. To show forth Thy loving kindness in the morning and Thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For Thou, Lord has made me glad through thy work. I will try up in the work of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doeth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is they that shall be destroyed forever. But thou, O Lord, art most high forevermore. Mm. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for they shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered, but my horn shall th uh, thou shalt exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eye also shall see my desire on mine enemies, and mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like the cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age, and they shall uh, be fat and flourishing to show unto the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. That is our God. So with this fittingly, I would like to close in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, Father. I thank you um, that I can even speak to you in prayer, Father, that I have this communication, Father. It was, it was a costly thing you did, Father, that provided this for us, to send your son to do what he did for us, Father. Um, but I am most thankful for that, Father, and I, I adore you. Um, and I just pray that as we leave here today, Father, that as we pray, um, our communication with you will be uh, of, of righteous quality, Father, that we speak uh, only the things that glorify you, Father, um, in our day-to-day. -day. Thank you for bringing us here together, Father, and protect us as we leave, Father. I pray this all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.